So I think by and large, it's convicting to me. I mean, we are, all are wrestling through this, but on Sunday morning, if, our, if my kids said, hey, I wanna miss school, you, know, you say, hey, get to school. If they wanna miss you know, travel soccer or sport, you say, hey, you committed to the team. And if they say, hey, let's miss church, you say, yeah, I'm tired too. Well, hey there, friends. Welcome to another exciting edition of The Link. I hope these episodes have been very encouraging to you. If you're part of the Woodside family, welcome back. If you're a friend and just kind of taking a sneak peek at The Link, just know that you are always welcome here. At The Link, we try to live at the intersection of faith and culture. If you're talking about it at home, on social media, at the water cooler at work, we want to talk about it here, but from a distinctly Christian worldview perspective through the lens of Scripture. Today, we want to take up a very important subject, one that is near and dear to my heart, and maybe even personal to you, the question of why are so many people leaving the faith? And how should we respond when that happens? Maybe you have noticed that there's been seemingly an, an uptick, an influx of stories of pastors or youth workers or even worship leaders who have uh, once been uh, shining lights for the faith who now would deny that God even exists and who have fully walked away from the church. No doubt you have heard reports about millennials and Gen Zs who uh, in large fashion have decided to walk out of the church and to live secular lives. So what do we do when this touches us personally, someone we love, or even our own local churches? We're gonna talk about that today and I've invited some people who I really enjoy and uh, that are much smarter than me to have this discussion. First sitting to my right is Pastor Dave Carlson. He is our pastor at our Dearborn campus. Dave, I so appreciate you and Kelly. How are you, brother? I'm doing all right. Really, uh, I guess, excited to be here. I don't know. I try to sit over here so I'm closer to Brandon. He's more my height than you. <laughs> well, you should be excited to be here. But yeah, obviously, it's a it's a difficult topic, but you uh, reference Brandon. Brandon Cleaver is here. Again, someone who I love, a great Christian thinker and apologist, also a member at our Dearborn campus. Brandon, thanks for joining. Oh, I'm glad to be here, and I know I'm, I'm good if I'm sitting next to my pastor. So there we go. Pastor to the left here. So. There we go. And then uh, Dan Trepo, who is here to uh, really help us to understand the next generation. Dan works for Crew that was formerly Campus Crusade for Christ. He does campus ministry in the city of Detroit. It is so great to have you with me, Dan. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, you know, I think that, Dave, we need to just first think historically. This isn't new. Uh, there's always been those who have walked away from the Christian faith. You even read about it in 1 John. We just took our church through a study of 1 John where John had to address it. But it does seem like there's this trajectory of reasons that are becoming increasingly more complex and nuanced. So can you kind of talk about the uh, the kind of history and bring us up to the present of this problem of people walking away from the faith. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on this 12 hour edition of The Link where we can go <laughs> through the full church history of people walking away from the faith. And you know, um, in Ecclesiastes we hear, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And a lot of times we have this tendency as believers to think the moment we're in is uniquely difficult. And there are certainly unique difficulties we face. Yes. But when we go back to the early church, as you referenced, recently we were in First John as a church, and Kostenberger argues that 1 John is written primarily because of a division that takes place in the church in Ephesus, yeah. where a large group of people walked away because of a false theology that was being taught, a Gnostic theology that had infected the church and led people away. And there are certainly people out there teaching lies. One of the earliest controversies that the early church fathers had to address theologically was because of people who'd walked away, not because of internal theological factors, but because of external factors and persecution. That when persecution arises, we see this path in the church where we see people walking away from the faith because of that extrinsic external persecution. And then as we go through that first 400 years or so of church history up to Constantine, there's this path where it wasn't just persecution throughout the entire time. There was a time where it was acceptable and then unacceptable to follow Christ. And so people would come to faith in a time when it was acceptable, in a time where society was in favor, and then society would turn against it and these people would walk away. And at the same time, you had brothers and sisters who were being beaten for their faith, who were being tortured for their faith, 
they were labeled as the confessors of the church. We know the martyrs, the, the martyrs have been yes. uh, familiar to us, but the confessors of the church, and these confessors then had to address, we who stayed, how do we view those who left? And how do we address even the idea of their faith? Was their faith genuine? Can they come back in? What does it mean to re-engage? And so some of the questions we wrestle with, they were wrestled with by the early church fathers. They're not new to us. And then as we think through people leaving, you know, I think of it in terms of perhaps movements and then individuals. And I think that's a helpful yeah, that category to, to come up with, to say we see these movements of the confessors and then those who abandoned the faith in the persecution. We also see a movement like the Protestant Reformation, this group of uh, men and women who didn't desire to leave the Catholic Church. They decided to be within the church reforming it, right? They, they did, yeah. It wasn't the Protestant exodus. It was the Protestant Reformation, this desire to reform God's church and remain as a part of it. Um, but in time, they weren't able to stay because the church of the time disagreed with the theology that God had reinvigorated and reilluminated in the hearts of the Protestant church fathers who, who were leading in that. And we see these movements, these rediscoveries, these philosophical reorientations taking place all the time. And one that was popular when I was in college as a student in crew was the emergent church. Right? It's something that uh, has fallen out of our lexicon in the past decade, but something where I remember there were books written on the emergent church and what does it mean? Is it the church? Are we still a part of the church if we're in an emergent movement? And um, we, we come up to these new controversies all the time in these movement levels, but I think it's important too, we can address the movements, but within every movement, it's made up of thousands upon thousands of individuals. Yeah. And each of those individuals is unique. It has a distinct story, a distinct way of approaching it. Maybe they buy into everything that's a part of the movement. Maybe they have just latched onto that movement as an explanation for internal issues they have. When you get onto the individual level, you'll see sometimes it's those external factors, those circumstances they've experienced. Uh, there are many people who left the Catholic Church over issues that came out because of reporting out of Boston, you know, a decade yeah, ago yeah, related to abuse and scandals that had taken place. There are people who have been personally hurt by people in the church. Yeah. And oftentimes that personal story will resonate far more deeply with someone than any sort of theological truth. And if you can't come onto someone's personal level, whatever else is out there, it's often that personal level, that personal hurt that is driving many of the doubts that are out there. Not to say that the doubts are illegitimate or to delegitimize those doubts, but you need to be able to address the person who's behind those doubts and, and to talk with them and what they're personally You know, it's really interesting that you bring this up. You just gave us in, in a really tight synopsis of all of church history, starting with John's uh, first epistle to now, um, a, about a dozen or so reasons. But whether it is heresy or persecution or just church hurt, uh, what I do find encouraging in what you said is that this isn't new and there is a lot of church history that we can read, we can study uh, scripture that we can uh, in, in, imbibe into our own hearts to help us to know how we should respond. I also agree with you that this is not just about movements, uh, generational phenomenons, this is about individuals, about real people. Uh, Dan, you work with um, a segment, though, a social segment of, of, of our, our population, which is millennials, Gen Z more specifically. Um, what are you hearing? Because just about every reporting agency from uh, Barna to Lifeway to Pew are reporting, man, they're leaving, they're exiting. Some say 70%, up to 70% by the time they get to our college campuses. What are some of the reasons why? Yeah, that's a great question. I think just to start with the numbers we're seeing, um, we try to survey every student who comes onto the college campus, which you probably remember, but that's our big strategy is just ask them, hey, what's your spiritual background? Do you wanna know more about God? Um, would you like to um, check out a Bible study and learn more? And we'll find maybe 10 to 25% of the students have some kind of Christian background, depending on the campus. Um, but even within that 25%, there's a bell curve. And there's these, these top students who say, man, I want to get involved in a group. I want to share my faith. And, and fortunately for us, some of those have been Woodside students. But then you've got that other side of the bell curve where you've got students saying, I'm checking out. I want to take a break. But honestly, the vast majority of the curve are students who are saying, I'll see what happens at college. 
And so I don't know if it's correct to say that they're actively leaving so much as they're just seeing which way are they going to go and what's going to happen. Um, so I think that's kind of what we're seeing on the college campus. People are generally open to hearing the gospel. I think that's probably something people need to know, that the average person you would meet would actually be interested in hearing about Christ if the conversation was like interesting and reciprocal and, respe and respectful. Um, I know at Royal Oak, we're going through Place for a Purpose right now. And uh, in that book, they kind of cite a study where 82% of people would be interested in having that kind of conversation about Christ. So I think that's something we misunderstand. Um, but the unfortunate truth is even the students who are coming out of our churches, they need that conversation to really say, what is the gospel? So here's what I love about what you just said. I, I think about the way that I've come to uh, maybe mature in my understanding of the gospel in, in that for the longest I saw the gospel as something that those who um, didn't know Christ or were apart from Christ uh, needed, and it was something that we simply shared with them. Uh, but now I recognize that we all need the gospel um, and that we all in many ways are continually converting to greater fidelity to the gospel. And so what you're saying is let's not just share the gospel with the atheist neighbor or the Muslim uh, student on the college campus, but there's a lot of kids who are coming from churches who need to be engaged with the gospel. I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, Brandon, when I think about what both Dave and Dan have shared with me, I, I respect the fact that a lot of reason why people are leaving is because of false theologies, uh, philosophies, maybe even hurt, um, uh, maybe even persecution. But how much does the church have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question about how we have maybe uh, wounded the testimony of Christ because of how we deal with issues of politics and, and social justice issues? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Pastor Brooks, you know, at the beginning, you mentioned that there's been this uptick of people leaving the church and uh, especially young folks. And I think there's also been an up uptick of the tension sort of that we find between these issues of politics and, and social justice. And I think more recently it's begun probably around 2012 with the uh, uh, murder of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman. And obviously things have happened ever since then. And there's been movements that have cropped up that have really forced more of the conversation of politics and social justice. And then obviously everything kind of culminated in this sort of global awareness of issues of justice and politics. Uh, th that intersection last year with uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna, uh, Breonna Taylor, just to name a few. And I think that when these, when these issues crop up uh, in, within society, the church is forced to ask ourselves, what's our role in it? Uh, if any, at all. And I think even when we say the word, or when you say the, the word social justice, there's going to be people watching this that immediately connect a, a particular political affiliation with that phrase, and it can be quite uh, jarring for some. So for a second, I just want to throw that phrase out and just talk about justice in and of itself. I think as Christians, we would say that justice is central to um, the, the biblical narrative is central to one of God's attributes. I mean, we talk about in Psalm 189 that he says that the very uh, foundation of his throne is built on two things, and that's justice and righteousness. And then if we think about uh, how it plays out uh, as far as us as being believers and, and followers uh, of Christ. And we see that, I think that even in the, throughout the biblical narrative, we see in the Old Testament this, uh, uh, some of the biblical characters enacting justice and also dealing with uh, politics, or rather in that time, uh, the government. So you see, for example, uh, Moses, what did he do? He engaged Pharaoh, the government at that time, to liberate the Hebrews. We have Daniel uh, and his, uh, his, the narrative with, with how he dealt with King Nebuchadnezzar and, and uh, uh, facilitating the uh, translation of some dreams, and also deciding not to engage uh, with him when there was the mandate of, uh, of not to pray and things like that. So we see this engagement with politics and government throughout, throughout the Bible, uh, but we also see it in Christians throughout history. We have someone like uh, Frederick Douglass, 
who engaged in, in politics, and we have someone like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, an activist for uh, women's rights and for voting rights and things like that, and she was a, a staunch Christian. So I think as a church, we have to ask ourselves, how do we engage uh, in these issues of justice and politics? And also, what happens when we abdicate our duty to do this? You know, we talk about sins of commission, but it's also sins of omission. So what then happens when we don't do what we ought to do? So for us, Pastor Brooks, you know, growing up in Detroit, um, I think we both grew up in small, like primarily black Baptist uh, church churches. I've seen a lot of people walk away from the faith because churches of various kinds haven't dealt with these issues of justice, particularly during like the civil rights era, you saw some of the more what's called Afrocentric religions. These are religions where uh, it's more uh, based in the concerns and, and unique issues that arise from the African American uh, um, uh, narrative. Um, you see that there's this, uh, many of them will disengage with the church and will seek places where there's this affirmation of their identity, of value, of significance, of dignity. And so a lot of them will then go on to, to, to seek these, these false uh, religions. And again, many, much of that is often rooted in the church's inability to deal with justice and how it intersects uh, with politics. You know, it's interesting. I, I think there's a balance here, right? In, in that on the one hand, we can't abdicate our responsibility. We're called to seek the welfare of the cities that we are sent into. Uh, we are his representatives in the world. And so on the one hand, we engage fully uh, in our cultural mandate. On the other hand, I think that we can also be guilty of this type of political tribalism where we get so fully absorbed by the earthly politics of this world that it becomes a primary identity marker instead of, at best, a secondary affiliation that we have. And, uh, and I think that wherever we're at, we have to remember that we are his ambassadors and representatives. So if you're going to be involved in the politics of this world, be there as a believer, recognizing that both Democrats and Republicans need salvation, need Jesus, find salvation at the foot of the cross of Christ, and we need to be ambassadors for that message wherever we find ourselves. But I also hear you calling us to something more, and that is to bring practice to our message, that our message has to be both proclamation and demonstration, orthodoxy, orthopraxy, working together in order to be able to show uh, an embodied faith. And when communities that are hurting don't see that, then they will seek an alternative and we leave ourselves vulnerable for that type of exodus. You know, I think about this, guys, and maybe this is a question all of us can try to take a stab at, but I'll start with you, Pastor Dave. What should we do? What should our response be if a brother or sister leaves the faith? Yeah, it's not a simple question, right? It's, it's not something where we, we necessarily need to have one base response. There, there are categories and ways we can talk about it, but if someone hears this and says, okay, I just got six steps on how to bring someone back into faith, right? Yeah. There's a profound misunderstanding of what's going on if someone walks away with that. I think of Galatians 6, right? When you see a brother who stumbles, care for them, reach out to them. You go after them, but be careful that you don't stumble along with them, yes. right? And, and just, I think personally, reclaiming the gospel and understanding what the gospel means to us will help us proclaim the gospel into the brokenness that someone else is experiencing. In 1 Corinthians 15, we hear Paul addressing the Corinthian church, and he says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. And understanding the personal spiritual formation role that the gospel plays for us is immensely important because as we are growing in Christ and understanding how at the root of every problem is sin, and if the root of every problem is sin, then the answer to every problem is the gospel, is Jesus, 
then we'll begin to understand and be able to speak into the issues that other people are experiencing, the problems they're experiencing, whether it's hurt within the church, whether it is some theological issue they're experiencing, whether it's some sin issue that is tempting and driving them away, being able to speak into profoundly how Jesus is better. You know, it's great that you bring that up because on my radio program, often I'll get calls from a parent or a friend who's grieving because someone they love has walked away from the faith. And I will often say to them that this is a opportunity for growth for you. And so when you say the reclaiming of the gospel, particularly for those who have been misled, mis uh, uh, deceived by some false teaching, oftentimes we want someone else to do our homework for us. Uh, but it's an opportunity for a mom or a dad, a friend, brother, sister, spouse, to say, man, I need to deepen my understanding of the gospel so that I can respond to the, the questions that are being presented to me, and not as a check the box, but in a heart driven by love to be able to regain a brother or a sister. You know, um, I'd love, Dan, for you to maybe speak to parents about this. Yeah. I mean, what difference does a, does a parent make in the life of a child? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate you saying that because as a parent, it's terrifying because our culture has gone from thinking, oh, Christians they're, think they're better than us to Christianity is immoral. Yeah. And so I think we're raising our kids. I've got four kids. We're raising them in a culture that by and large is seeing their beliefs as, as wrong and dangerous. And so we really have to be discipling them in those beliefs. But at the same point, they're individuals. They're going to become adults, and they're going to have to ask for themselves, like, does this make sense? My culture is telling me this is wrong. Is it wrong? And, and there will be moments of training. You know, Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, don't exasperate your kids, but bring them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. So that's, that's on me. But at a certain point, they're going to have to say, is this my thing? And for some, some of my kids, they're going to listen to what I said, and some of them are going to learn it on their own. Yeah. And I'm going to have to be patient. I, I'm, I'm going to be praying. I'll probably be calling Brandon, crying, like, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. because they're, they're going to become individuals that have to make up their own mind. Now, you did share some stats, though, with us before we started recording on, uh, man, this is a game changer, just being a parent who is involved. I'm, I was freaked out about this topic because I'm a first-generation Christian. I came to Christ through a Gideon's Bible. Wow. But for my kids, I'm trying to raise them the ordinary way. And what are my odds? You know, and I'm kind of reading up. Um, one, if a dad is a Christian and has a good relationship with his kids, it, I, I was reading it, it takes the, the chance from them walking with God from 50 to 70%. Um, if, you, if your kid's in church every week, it, it takes them to 80% likely. If it's twice a week, you know, you put them in church in a, a youth group, you're at 90% likely they'll still identify as a Christian. So I think by and large, it's convicting to me. I mean, we are, all are wrestling through this, but on Sunday morning, if, our, if my kids said, hey, I want to miss school, you know, you say, hey, get to school. If they want to miss, you know, travel soccer or sport, you say, hey, you committed to the team. And if they say, hey, let's miss church, you say, yeah, I'm tired too. And we're training them. We're training them in how important is this to us. So that's something God's been really convicting me about personally. No wonder I'm a Christian. My mom took me to church yeah. like every <laughs> day. So here we go. Yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting because even as pastors, I mean, you know, uh, we have Wednesday night uh, group gathering for our students. And uh, man, there's a lot of Wednesdays where I have to remind myself of the fact that this is vital for uh, I got a teenage daughter for her spiritual formation, and, uh, and it does cause me to appreciate my parents who uh, invested in me uh, spiritually. So moms and dads, you make a huge difference. And let me just say uh, to grandmas and grandpas too, you make a huge difference in whether or not your children stay in the faith as you hang in there with them and uh, bear witness to Christ and keep them connected to a faith community. You know, um, uh, Brandy, and I would love for you to just be able to uh, maybe help the person who feels like, I don't even know how to answer these questions. What would you say to uh, that person on what they should do? Yeah, I think the, the beautiful thing about when we see uh, these instances of doubt in the Bible, we have, for example, John the Baptist, who's he's in jail and he's starting to doubt about is, is Christ, is this the guy who I really thought, you know, he was? And then we have, of course, Thomas, doubting Thomas, as he's become infam infamously known as, you know, in those two examples, and there's so many more, that 
there wasn't a condemnation of their doubt. And I think that's often what people feel like, that there's, if I come out with these doubts, I'm gonna be condemned, I'm gonna be seen as someone who's just walking away totally from the faith and it, there's no questioning involved. But the beautiful thing is that uh, Jesus affirmed them and he yes. dealt with them and he loved them uh, in, in their doubts. And I think that's what we have to do. I spent um, about four or five years, Pastor Brooks, serving as a Stephen minister. And for those who might not know, Stephen minister is a lay person who walks through a crisis of various kinds, be it losing a job to someone who's literally on their deathbed, walking with them through this crisis in a Christ-like manner. And the number one thing, many of these people had doubts, the number one thing that all of them said that was so important to them was that you cared and you listened. And a lot of times that's what people want. They want someone who cares and listens and who will listen to the questions that they have and answer them. And that doesn't mean that we have to be as smart as Pastor Dave, as smart as yeah, Dan, yeah, or as yeah, smart yeah. as yourself and know all, <laughs> know all the answers, uh, or, or at least a lot of them. Um, but it means that we care enough that if we don't know, we go back, we investigate, and we talk to them, and we engage with them. Oftentimes, I think, I'll just say this in closing, what's missing is that intimacy. I think you brought up that word. Um, particularly as, as males in the Christian faith, I think we maybe struggle with what it means to, to be intimate. But when we're, we're intimate with others, we, we can be totally open, we can be accountable, we can be transparent, and, and that facilitates an environment of where uh, uh, doubts can come out and we can have good and robust discussions about this. That's things. good, yeah. that's really good. You know, I forget who said this, this, uh, this quote, but sometimes people build up walls to keep people out, but oftentimes people build up walls to see if anyone loves them enough to tear it down. And this is what I hear you saying, is that uh, when these walls do come up, uh, let's demonstrate that we love people enough to brick by brick, lovingly, patiently uh, take those walls down and uh, hopefully win a brother or sister back to Christ. Uh, man, there's so much more that we can say. I will say this, that in the uh, postscript for this episode, uh, all of us are recommending resources for you to read so that you can begin to wrap your heart and mind around this phenomenon of people leaving the faith. As Pastor Dave said at the outset, this isn't new. So there is a lot of great Christian thinking on this that can really help you to be able to reach your son and daughter, to be able to reach your neighbor or friend who has walked away from the faith. And if you're struggling with doubts, I wanna let you know that your campus pastors are here to help you to process through those things and that the gospel is big enough for our doubts. You don't have to run from Christ with your questions, but run boldly to him. And, uh, and I believe that we'll find answers that not only satisfy the, the questions of our head, but the longings of our heart as well. I wanna ask Pastor Dave if he can quickly close us in prayer. Dear Jesus, we are grateful that you came as light into darkness, and that you came as the way, the truth, and the life. Lord God, we are faced day upon day with questions on truth, on righteousness, on the way in which we should live, on where we might find abundant life. But Jesus, you came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Yet so often this world, the spiritual forces in this world, even our own flesh cry out and say there is another way to life. There is a higher order of truth. There is a different way in which you can live. But Jesus, you came and revealed that as corrupt for what it is. God, we pray that we, the church, would be a people who understand your gospel enough to repent when we fall short as people, when we are not living out your ways, when we are not proclaiming your truth, when we are not standing for your justice. And God, as we do that, we pray that you would wrap your arms around the brothers and sisters among us who are struggling with these questions, who are struggling with these temptations, that they would meet you. Lord God, if there is someone listening right now 
who feels that pull, that temptation, I pray that your spirit would comfort. Your spirit would come and proclaim and glorify you as you have sent him to do in this world. God, we thank you for the power of your spirit who works in our lives to glorify your son and lead us into truth. Lead us as individuals into truth so that we as the church may be your city on a hill to a world that needs it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Uh, friends, listen, we, we love you. We love your family as well. So if you do have someone in your life that is presently struggling with doubts or maybe even recently walked away from the faith, feel free to just leave their name in the comment section so that we can be praying uh, for them and for you. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And I can't wait till we're together again on the next edition of The Link.